Hey, Jim, how's it going? It's going great. We're just officially starting right now. So your time is, is superb. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, so we just are here. Uh, I'm Jim. We found out it's kind of useful just to say who you are, maybe where you're from, if, where you are, if you want to. But then we just have an hour and we talk about whatever we talk about. And um, we average a few minutes or so. We have an egg timer that shows how long we've been talking. And we quit at, one, at two o'clock unless we really, really, some of us want to chat a little bit more. OK, James, wanna, uh, I'm oh. James Donor, and let's move ahead. James, why don't you introduce yourself? My name is James Weikert. Um, I am a former MBA student at Fordham, and uh, Jim Stoner was my professor at that time. I am currently the project manager of uh, Global Movement. That is an initiative that Jim Stoner and I started, um, God, going back about a year, over a year now, um, dealing with um, uh, curriculum change uh, to address sustainability. And I think you're, weren't you a Michael student also? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and his assist, and, and his, um, I, I, I was also assisting him. And you were, you were chair, you were president of Net Impact chapter at Fordham too. Yeah. <laughs> Go away and give us the egg timer. <laughs> Next. All right, I'll go next. I'm Robert Schroff from the Marin Chair of Global Competitiveness at Duquesne University's MBA in Sustainability Program in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Andrew, you look like you're about ready to speak. Sure, I'm always ready to speak. Uh, hi all, uh, Andrew Winston. I have my own practice. I work with multinationals, helping them understand the world's megatrends, mostly around social and environmental issues. Um, and help them develop strategies and try to help the world pivot to a, a thriving future. I speak, I write, I consult, and kind of do my own thing. And you have a new book coming out fairly soon, is that right? Well, it's going to be a while, till September. Yeah, I have a, a book I've been writing this year, uh, co-authored with Paul Pullman, who was the former Unilever CEO. Um, draft is done, we'll be editing, and we'll be, we'll be out probably August, September. Great. The title is Net Positive. Tony? Yeah, this is uh, Tony Annette. Uh, I spent most of my career at the IMF, uh, as a, including as a speechwriter to the managing director. I now <clears throat> have pivoted and I work with um, uh, both uh, Jeff Sachs, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, as a senior advisor, and also at the uh, be with the Gabelli School to teach a course on modern economics for a sustainable and inclusive world with Jeff Sachs. Uh, in the spring. And I'm also writing a book called Caffeinomics, which also should be coming out around next September. Great, thank you. Penelope? Uh, hi, I'm Penelope. I'm a friend of Jim's. I'm a freshman in Kentucky, pretty small town, Kentucky. And I'm very interested with sustainability. And when I grow up, I hope to be an environmental engineer. So. Yeah, I'm really interested in this stuff and I love to talk about it and hear about it. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Kristen? Hi, I'm Kristen Kasanovich and uh, I wanna thank the two gyms for this incredible <laughs> venue. I'm from Santa Clara University, which is in the Bay Area, Northern California. And I run a project there called TURN, which is a week of climate crisis awareness and action. Um, we try to stop the university for a week and have people think about nothing but the climate crisis for one week in October and one week in April. I think all of us will be very interested in what you're doing. Penelope maybe particularly will be interested. Otto, welcome. Good to see you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry for coming in a minute late. Um, so um, my name is Otto Schammer. I'm working out of MIT. I'm co-founder of the uh, Presencing Institute. And um, I, I launched um, last year, this year, um, uh, an initiative called Gaia, Global Activation of Intention and Action, which uh, brought people together around how to respond to, uh, to COVID and to uh, reimagining our own path forward in regard to climate and others. <clears throat> Great, so we'll hear more about that too. 
Michael? Yeah, well, good to see you all again and meet you. Michael Pearson, Fordham University, and currently in the car in a Tesla uh, that needs to be charged. So <laughs> Andrew dubs me the uh, Uber Uber driver. Um, but um, I'm, yeah, I'm interested in all things that can empower, enliven, and enlighten people. So that's, that's what I'm about, and we'll share more. Okay, I'll be quiet for a little while and see who speaks next, and just tell us what you want to tell us. On what topic? Yes, I see the timer flipping, or so I thought. Robert, I'll give a little bit more background, I guess, about myself. Um, some of the projects that I'm currently working on are actually trying to make our business school a living laboratory and putting meters and sensors within the building and a live dashboard so that when people walk into the building, they can see a real-time energy consumption, water consumption, see greenhouse gas emissions into our quality measures, and then start thinking about why is the air outside our building worse than the air inside our building? As we live in one of the eighth worst polluted cities in the United States, we have coal powered utilities around us and most people don't think about it because they can't see it, but we have air quality issues. So we're trying to use the building as a way to help make that more visible to people when doing it. So some of my work right now is in high performance buildings. Other work is in sustainable supply chain management. And I have a book that's out and we use it in our number one ranked MBA in sustainability program in the United States on integrated management and how sustainability creates value for any business. So I really love finding things at the intersection of disciplines to show people that this is already happening, that we have best practices and that we can just make them better. And more people can be like Michael and be in e-vehicles and spend 90% less on their energy for trans, you know, to move them from one place to another, as most people don't realize how much money they spend in a lifetime on transportation and how much of it we waste. So there's a few things maybe I could use as catalyst for others to jump off of. You remember that old stories about um, how fast we drive and the average speed at which we drive our automobiles? Mm. Do, you, do you remember that one? No, tell me the numbers though. It's, uh, I'll, I'll, if, I, if I get a chance, I'll get to it today. If not, okay. Well, I know that you know, I can generate my own electricity 40% cheaper than my utility company and that we can drive e-vehicles 90% cheaper than we can combustion engine vehicles. We'll spend about $100,000 in our lifetime to drive 50 years. And from that, we'll waste, if we use a combustion engine vehicle, we'll waste about 81% of every gallon. But I can drive my e-vehicle right now for $175 for 10,000 miles. Right. Do, do, do you all know that one about uh, the average speed at which you drive your car? Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think the average speed is, the average speed you drive your, your car during a year? Well, the trick is that you take the number of miles you drive as the numerator and you divide it by time. And the time you use is the time it takes, how much hours you have, how many hours you have to work to pay for the car, to pay for the gas, to pay for the insurance, and the time you actually spend behind the wheel driving the car and I forget a couple of other dimensions, and it comes out to average about four miles to five miles an hour when you put all that other stuff in. So it's a wonderful little gimmick, I think, for what we do. And Kristen, uh, why don't you tell us about what you're doing a little bit to start? Sure, um, and I just, I, I love to talk about TURN because it's run by all kinds of people like yourselves, um, People, you know, from university age students all the way up to, um, I guess, octogenarians. Um, and it's, it's run by people that are partnering with the project that come in to provide a specialty talk on any kind of discipline. And I know all of us in this room are probably interdisciplinarists because we're working on the problem of climate and it requires so many angles, um, so many books, so many specialties, you know, that we need to kind of add on to whatever we started with in this academic world. So TURN is interdisciplinary and we have talks on 
that take the perspective that you know people studying law might be interested in uh, business people of course engineers of course scientists of course but also artists all of the humanities are represented religious studies um, prominent and you know you have an evening on poetry theater dance visual art and music of the climate crisis followed by a um, maybe a session on psych the psychology of the climate crisis on eco anxiety we try to help people process things on an embodied level as well as the cognitive level we have affective domain sessions we have student driven things that are about activism and we connect to some of the larger activist groups in the country in the world and locally and right at our school so um, it kind of has an open feeling but I curate it so I produce about 20 events in five days that go from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. and people can just plug in anytime it's all on zoom right now can you do that in the fall and the spring? Yeah, yeah. We kind of bookend the academic year. So we have this one week of climate crisis thinking at the beginning of the year. Then people can kind of maybe shift behaviors, think about their lives, be a little more aware. Then check in again in April um, when they're just about to leave the school year. Yeah. And anybody can just check in by knowing the URL and everything? Yeah, yeah. It's free. Yeah. It's open to the public. And, and you talked to him, we talked a couple days ago. I just met Kristen just a couple days ago. You talked about really dealing with the denial of climate change and the, the terror we have if we start thinking about it and how you work your way through that. Is that right? Yeah, am I allowed to go on? Because that thing flipped, didn't it, Jim? <laughs> um, I'll just answer your question. Yes, um, my sense was that many sustainability efforts on uh, campuses today from people I've talked to at all different institutions don't get at the urgency of the problem. They're, they're doing all the right things. They have all the right information. They're, they're getting people interested, maybe concerned, but not alarmed. And so I thought, well, something needs to alarm people a little more. And um, I have a background in theater and dance and tragedy and comedy. And um, so I thought, well, you know, this really is a tragedy. And we're in the, we're just about to start the fifth act of a five act play. And the fourth, the first four acts have been written and we get to write the fifth and so let's talk about what needs to be done let's let our feelings come out let's go through the full cycle of grief here and admit our losses and admit our pain and admit our anger and frustration particularly my students age uh, people are angry at us on this call um, and frustrated with us and they need to be able to process that and then get past that um, and you know maybe still feel some of that but go into acceptance and then action so in five days I try to get people through the entire cycle of grief, no matter which headliner they come to. Um, it's not possible, but it's what I try to do. It's my quixotic adventure. And so I feel that um, the, one of the main things that, that distinguishes TURN is that we have 50% BIPOC speakers and speakers from vulnerable populations. Like we, we listen to undocumented immigrants. We listen to people without any possessions. We listen to women and children's voices. And we listen to voices that aren't typically represented in the sustainability or environmental movements. Um, they're getting more and more represented, but they're highly represented. We, we came out of the gate with turn starting last year with a quite high um, Michael, you've been involved diversity. in so many things. Um, uh, it occurs to me that the, uh, the Jesuit network adventure is particularly exciting, plus your edutainment that you've been involved in. I know Tristan was interested in hearing about that. I'm sure everybody is. Give, give us a little update there. So yeah, we, uh, and some of you know, we have started an initiative with the network of Fusion, yeah. Hear me? Uh, this is my typical. That's the Tesla taking too much of energy, probably. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, my super new 5G phone that can't handle transitions somehow. <laughs> so, now it's good, actually. Now the audio is, now it's good. Yeah, so great. So um, yeah, the, the, uh, the focus is to change the introductory courses. And that's also one of the reasons why Jeff and Tony are uh, uh, teaching that for us, which is an amazing uh, thing and adventure to see. And um, we are also focused on developing material that uh, focuses on a new paradigm, the new narrative 
of of what it means to be in business, to be human, and 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 see business as a human activity, and uh, that led us right now to work with folks at Sesame Street, and we're talking with documentary filmmakers to develop content that may bring this new paradigm to life in specifically the current context of flipped classrooms and um, distance learning. And uh, there is an opportunity for scale that we're uh, playing with, experimenting with, to see if we have this kind of content newly developed for flipped classroom environments, we can scale it more quickly possibly than we would have thought before. So that's what we're experimenting with right now. Um, and I see I have some more sand coming, but I, I stop. And, and the first two that you've done are available, right? We produced four episodes. Um, they're available. Four. And, and we're now editing and re-editing and, and adjusting, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And James and I were in Otto's uh, recent MOOC on creating the future from, from the, working from the future. I forgot the exact phrasing. Otto, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing there with Gaia and everything else? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I was just um, uh, listening to you, Kristen. Uh, so uh, something came to my mind, I was, um, when I look at my own experience, where have I, re we, we know that a big part of the problem is what happens in business schools. And um, so um, one of the more interesting uh, examples that I have seen is Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, they basically crunched the entire existing program down to 66%, uh, freed up a third of credit points and of time and dedicate that to something that you have, Kristen, in your bookend, right? The first week, the last week, but they do that throughout, right? So with a third of the time, it's called um, Global Challenges. And it's basically following the, the U process in terms of immersing them into the SDG related uh, challenges. Then everyone needs uh, uh, the second stage, deep reflection practices. Um, all the Stockholm School of Economics, economic students learn to meditate, right? And then um, uh, prototyping, right? On SDG relevant things in the real world uh, in the third stage. So that's, um, and then when you double click on that, how the hell did that happen, right? In the, uh, 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 the back story, which I found really interesting is, is not like your usual systems thinking sustainability experts, um, doomsday scenario uh, advocates, it's artists. So the, the entire half of the entire uh, core team has an art related background. And um, then some others came in kind of uh, through, through the uh, U process because the whole thing started with through a team, so I, I teach an online class, ULAB, and they basically took that model, they applied that to their school. So, so there is a, but the, the U process basically applying, uh, you know, so, so applying the deep creative process to leadership and to systems thinking basically, right? So it's um, very much related to what you said. So that's, uh, that's just the first thing um, that comes to my mind. And um, I guess another maybe, um, partially, I, I missed the framing of the whole thing up front, I must say. So I'm kind of going a little bit on, on intuition, what might be relevant here. But um, uh, another relevant experience I have uh, had uh, recently is um, with the, um, so, so I, um, I did this Gaia that I mentioned. Kind of, it's basically creating a holding space for people leaning into the current moment. Uh, we did some research on that. We had 7,000 regular um, uh, participants. So it's like, and it, so it's sessions that blend um, mindfulness, kind of the current moment, uh, deep listening, small group discussion, and social arts, right? So, it's, so that's kind of a 90 minute arc usually. And um, 13,000 people involved, but 7,000 of them really over three months period kind of taking that journey. And um, then uh, some of them came out of the UN. So then we, they said, let's do that for the UN. 
which we did over the summer, which now resulted in a, a three-point intervention with the UN um, system, kind of that his, um, so there's one uh, part just about um, new dialogue spaces for the entire organization, right? That, that open, so called awareness-based systems change, kind of really reimagine the path forward, but more like as a conversation space. And then there's a capacity building track, and then there are labs, right? So SDG uh, impact labs on the level of countries uh, in, in 14 different countries coming out next year. So it, it is interesting, and the, the backdrop of all of that, which happens uh, fairly rapidly, I mean, if you at least if you look at it from UN um, usual planning cycles, um, what, what's the backdrop of that? It's the crisis that we live in, the crisis of the institutions, right? Multilateralism under attack and not really functional in most cases. And it's also kind of the human awareness that um, something entirely different is necessary and was always necessary, but now it's really mission critical. And I think that's it's just like a, if, if stuff like that even happens on slow institute, uh, so on the level of really slow and complex institutions like the UN, it just, it gives us, it's a little data point about what is possible now and that there is a huge potential really to, uh, that can be uh, for transformation, right? There's an ne ob objective necessity for transformation, there's a subjective felt sense of that something entirely different should be, uh, uh, you know, um, it could be possible. But what's often not there is the transformation literacy to really translate this potential into changed behavior on the level of the collective. And that's where I try to contribute a little bit. And, um, but I, I guess what I, um, what I want to say is that what I feel is the whenever, um, I mean, in the darkest hour, right, of the 20th century, 1941, that's when the UN was born. So whenever there's, you know, uh, the, the, whenever the, um, the, the, the time is the, more, the darkest, right, the, the, the moment of possibility is right there. And I think that's how I feel about the current moment. And that's um, maybe also what, um, what brings you, Jim, to, uh, uh, you know, to convene this group here. Thank you. I'm going to try and stay out of the way for a moment. OK, Andrew, I was going to ask about the net positive concept and what you can tell us more about than that. Yeah, I mean, it's. Um... I mean, it's oversimplified as a phrase, but that's what book titles do, right? I mean, <laughs> you have to kind of summarize something that's complicated. Uh, I mean, you know, within the sustainability world, people have been using phrases like net positive for a number of years, and they kind of mean offsetting fundamentally. Like if you produce some carbon, you can buy some renewables over there, you can buy some offsets and even it out. We're, we're talking about it kind of as a broader, a broader purpose. The, the subtitle of the book is How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. And... So it's about how do you build a business that's in service to the world, that is, you know, in its function, creating a positive outcome, really at all levels and all scales. I mean, that's the ideal: is that at every stage in the in the supply chain, so every every supplier, every customer use of product, um, for every community, your employees, to the communities you operate in, to every product, that they should produce a positive impact. Um, and you know, that's an ideal. That's almost impossible on some level, you know, to, to do with certain certain products. But the the kind of crux of the book is a lot of it is about, you know, in some sense, Unilever, because Paul is the, the co-author. But, uh, you know, we're trying to draw broader lessons from their experience and from other leaders. And a lot of it is about um, you know, the core of the book. It really gets to partnership and collaboration, which I think everybody here is pretty familiar with and does a lot of in that the, the scale of our problems have just grown so fast that the scale of solutions, you know, have to be, you have to be much bigger and much faster. And we're gonna need partnerships to continue to evolve and, and get deeper in ways that most companies are still pretty uncomfortable with, right? To, to sit down with peers, to sit down with communities, to sit down with uh, critics, um, 
we have an interesting discussion in the book about the difference in critics and cynics or skeptics and cynics and, you know, productive criticism from an NGO that has knowledge and can help you and say you're doing something wrong versus people who just hate business, frankly, or, um, you know, someone who just says, you know, business can't be part of the solution, which is just naive, frankly, but it's too big, right? So the, the logic of sitting down with all those stakeholders and with government and trying to create um, the policy and the cooperation that's needed to move entire systems, it's really difficult, right? And it's, and it's going to take a long time. Uh, and we know that we don't have that much time. So it's kind of a constant tension, right? In all the work that we all do, that to do this right takes real time. So it's kind of the, you know, the Dana Meadows or, you know, the idea of starting now, the best time to start is now, right? We better, we better get moving. I ran out of time. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there. The purple timer is just really strict. <laughs> I, I'm just curious, just from the conversation we've had so far about, I mean, Jim, I'm sure this was on purpose, but there's a really interesting mix here because you got people coming from academia, from the arts, from, uh, you know, the religious perspective that Tony, Tony brings and, um, you know, in business, that's all I really think about. And I just, I guess I'm curious where we think the, the way to reach people really is. I mean, it's all of it, obviously, but you know, what's, what's got the most potential for really shifting consciousness, right? Because what we're talking about in the book is how do you shift business consciousness to be about serving society, not the short-term shareholder? And how do, you, how do you make that the crux of business when we've had 50 years of neoliberal thinking that started in the academy, as you guys know. I mean, they purposely went into business schools and into undergrad to change the dialogue about markets and markets above all. And so we have to work to under, you know, undermine that logic and make it broader and more humane. But I'm just curious, you know, from this, a lot of the people on this call, like how do we, there's, there's such a disconnect right now with a certain percentage of the population that isn't, isn't operating in fact and science, um, which is so dangerous. And I wonder, does the religious community have a way in? Does the arts community have a way in? Like, how do we, how do we get people on the same page that we're even discussing the problems at the scale we need to? Right. Instead of debating whether they're problems, that, that the fact that we're still doing that on things like climate inequality, biodiversity is <laughs> crazy. Right? It's asinine. And I agree with the dog. I think yeah. you know, <laughs> it's a bad situation. James, is Michael muted? Uh, he is muted, uh, but he's muted because I think he wants to be. Uh, hold on a second. Are yeah, you? I, it, it, I, I'm, I'm trying to get in from my computer. I'm, I'm sort of holding up my phone here. Can you admit me? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we got du double Michael. <laughs> double Michael. Single Michael. Okay, now that you're unmuted, do you want to say something? <laughs> I thought I did already, so I, I'm not clear if, if everybody spoke. I want to hear Tony oh. and Penelope. We don't necessarily mark, uh, march uh, lockstep. People just chip in whenever. Uh, you okay, want, got it. You well, want to continue for a few moments? Sure. I mean, uh, I think Andrew and I connected some time ago around this idea of a narrative and how we can facilitate um, more collaboration and the... the I think the, the root cause we both saw located in, in how do we see business and its role in society, which is ultimately located in the, in the consciousness and the, the narrative that we speak into the world that was uh, conscious. Once, once I got present to the efforts that were done in prior iterations to transform stories and our thinking and our consciousness and our being in the world, I was seeing how well, uh, Otto, I th it must have been a theory you approached that these guys imitated in a way that was very successful and then just going at that in, in a new way uh, with a new story, it helped me to be more empowered and see what actions can be taken. And so that's, that's where I'm coming from. That's where I see the, the power of education. I don't think that education is going to do much with the urgency because it a, has a, such a lag effect. Uh, on the other hand, it's going to be critical, and in whatever way universities specifically can be convening places for these multi-stakeholder groups, including business, and and the societal groups that are unfortunately in many ways cynics, 
uh, I think Chris and you were talking about the process. We have sort of de disengaged. Otto, you're talking about this, like we're 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 deep presence and we're like disengaging from ourselves, from our whole human being, uh, in a way that we're we're okay with. With, with it, we're not okay with it. We're ultimately, we're, we're seeing all the signals that we're not okay with it. And that's the, where the huge opportunity is. I think that's where the conscientious, where the consciousness shift will ultimately happen. What you're experiencing with the UN, I think we're experiencing possibly in many places. And I hope that the tipping point will come very quickly. I think Andrew, you were reminding me at some point, I had this in my head that Ted Turner was saying, yeah, we, we will win and we'll, it will be soon. I don't know when that was. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was that was a long time ago, unfortunately. That was at the, I'm still waiting. It was the 2012, whatever cop was in Cancun. I don't go to many of them, but I went to that one and it was this awards, the Gigaton Awards. And he got up and he did the shortest speech I've ever seen. And it was so effective. He just basically got up and said, all of us are on the right side of history and we're going to win and we're going to win soon. And well, we could all have a really good debate about what winning means, right? I mean, I think from a scientific perspective, we're losing still, right? The, 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 the horizon we're shooting for on climate in particular just keeps moving away from us. But from the perspective of, is this on the agenda that people take it seriously? You know, we, we did win that battle. I mean, like the, the, in the corporate world, all the largest companies in the world believe climate change is an issue and know they have to talk about it, even if just to speak to millennials and Gen Z and kind of sound reasonable. And they have goals and they have targets. Like we won the battle to get it on the agenda. It's just the speed and scale and how fast it needs to go that we keep falling behind on because we're, we're constantly in the frame, you know, Michael, as you said of, from your work of that business must just be about profit maximization or dog eat dog, you know, and, and, and haven't approached it in this kind of systematic way about we all thrive, you know, we thrive as business when we all thrive. Um, and, and how do we make that, that shift, right, in, in consciousness and in narrative? Um, and, and without that, I just don't know how we get there, you know? So it's, it's yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to believe we're winning and we are on some level, but we're also losing. It's such a weird, I mean, it's a, it's a schizophrenic life in, in, in climate, right? You just, how can you not be depressed and somewhat optimistic, you know? I'm curious how Tony takes Andrew's question and you know, relates this to people in his classes. Well, I let me let me talk because Andrew mentioned the religious community. So I, sh I should. So I contributed to an initiative at the Vatican from 2016 to 2018 called Ethics in Action for Sustainable Development. And that brought together not only the experts in the field for the various topics in sustainable development, but also religious leaders from Catholicism, Judaism, Orthodoxy, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism, and you know what the the optimistic take there is there was a there's a huge as, as people here won't be surprised that there's a huge convergence as to you know what the most important issues in the world today are and all religions affirm that we have a common destiny and our common home and we have to take care of it. They all wouldn't use the, a lot of the religions wouldn't use the term creation the way some of us would but it's the same you know this the same kind of uh, deep respect and when i collaborated with religions for peace um their religious leaders came back to them and said well the two most important issues that we're dealing with we want you to focus on are re violent religious extremism and climate change they're the number one and number two um which is stunning i i so and i think you're kind of seeing that to a certain extent i I personally credit Pope Francis for the Paris Agreement. I think um, without the intervention of Pope Francis, I don't know, counterfactuals are hard, but we might not have had so many countries signing up for the Paris Agreement. Um, I think we have a problem in the US because a lot of what passes for Christianity in the US is this kind of very weird mishmash of Calvinism, American exceptionalism, prosperity gospel, which does not take sustainability seriously. Uh, to put it bluntly, um, and as those voices get louder, people uh, get more and more turned off of religion and religious solutions, which is a real shame because, in my view, the climate crisis is fundamentally a moral crisis. The moral crisis is more important than the technical and the financial aspect. And who are you going to get? Who who are you going to? Who who are the moral voices? 
And I think the religious traditions are the moral voices. And if those traditions are discounted or, disres or disrespected in any ways, I think we're in a lot of trouble. And to answer Robert's question, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm violating the pink. Um, is it pink or purple? The pink or purple uh, egg timer. <laughs> so I'll just say that uh, to Robert's question, the course that we're going to teach, that I'm going to teach with Jeff Sachs, is going to incorporate a lot of religion. We will be talking about what religious traditions specifically but not exclusively catholic social teaching can how how that can inform how we think about some of the big economic questions out there today climate change but also other questions so i'll i'll i'll, uh, I'll stop there and see what just, people think just a quick thought on that with tony is that i we've seen this the i think the pope's encyclical in 2015 was really important for linking environment and social and making it like yeah. this is one larger I think he was really early on that and really, you know, very smart about it um, and looking at to morality. But, you know, you've seen this, I'm sure when when he's spoken out recently again about capitalism or its failings, the cult of like the neoliberal love for markets is so strong yeah. that you'll see on Fox or whatever, they turn on the Pope, right? Yeah. Like instead of turning on their belief in markets above all and questioning whether it's moral, you'll see people who are, you know, using religion as a, an evangelicalism as a, you know, cudgel in their social battles, will we'll say the Pope should stay out of economic issues, right? I mean, I, it's just shocking to me, and we've seen it, frankly, in the buildup of the, the cult of Trump, that yeah. when someone turns on him, even a longtime advocate, the cult just says, well, they're the problem, not, yeah. not him. And it's scary, right? And I, you know, this level of kind of commitment to a philosophy that is failing us is just so hard to break. You know, I mean, I, I'm glad you guys are doing it from the school up. It has to start there and even K-12, right? We have to start yeah. from young people and, and change the way they think about, you know, the role of being a citizen and the role of business. But boy, you know, it's like we were 50 years behind on this, this, this dialogue. And, you know, we, we've lost on that so far, but I think, yeah, I guess I'm hopeful. I, I think the Otto was saying very hopeful things about the kind of dialogue or the or the the philosophy coming. I I'm I guess I don't feel as positive about it, but it, I'm glad to hear some people are. And and I was uh, uh, noticing Andrew that we are winning the battle um, because uh, that that's not always uh, felt right. So when you mentioned that, and so mm -hmm. so so maybe um, the. Maybe on the conversation side, uh, that's true, but we are not winning the battle on the behavioral side. I think there is still, we know all the right things. Maybe we even have the right moral principles and um, are able to broadcast them, but it's not, it's disconnected to what's happening actually. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the deeper issue. And I have one, maybe um, uh, a potentially relevant data point that, that is, um, uh, surfacing some of that because you know in many ways we, we deal with this knowing doing gap right on the level of the collective and and what i believe is that the only way of addressing that is not by i mean that's what we know it's not more data what's needed right it's not more good arguments uh, it, it's 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 even not moral reasoning i think what's needed is uh, an activation of the intelligence of the heart so when the head and the hand is disconnected on the level of the collective, you need an activation of the heart. And that's why uh, the social arts are so critical. And, um, and in, in general, kind of um, felt uh, experience. So the little data point I have is I have been running here in executive education at, at MIT Sloan, like uh, for a whole bunch of multi-sector leaders uh, programs and then one of the things we drag them through off, whether they want it or not, is kind of this climate change simulator, right? So it's like uh, you're basically in an experiential environment. It's a half day workshop and you're confronted with the collective impact of the decisions taken now. And everyone is uh, moving into a role and so on. And you can, so that is a little microcosm, right? That, so, I mean, that, that gives you the possibility to really watch the human dynamics, right? Of responding, moving from denial to uh, finally realizing it and from there to depression. And that, from there, I mean, maybe you stay there or uh, some, some other place. But what, um, 
what uh, what is so interesting to watch is even though you take some of the roles and then you make decisions, you see the projection, what it means for the end of the century. Um, you, you see kind of where at first kind of there's like marginal decision making, right? They, they each one has a country group, you represent the US or the EU or China or something. And, and they just start with their interests and they have marginal um, concessions to reality, so to speak, getting nowhere even close to what's necessary. Right, and only in the end, when some when there is some real shift happening, they begin to take the actions that then do make a difference. And um, so, when I look so back at these episodes that I have seen a number of times now, I would say there's like uh, three or so uh, critical enabling conditions. One is that there is a container. Basically, these people are stuck for half a day in that room. You cannot leave. Right, so you're in that role. Two, there is a facilitated process of letting the data sink in because everyone would look another way, but kind of to really being confronted with the collective impact of the collective decision making and then a facilitated process of letting that sink in is, um, of course, what we usually don't have. And you can watch how long it takes to really penetrate the mind. And then the third one is you have to feel it, right? So if it's just data projected and all the lines, it's still stuck here. It's only when people feel it and we include elements in the setup that are experiential, right? Then it's beginning to hit home. So it must be embodied, right? It must somehow connect with the other senses, not just kind of the intellect. And I think that's somehow because that, so if you put these things into place, yes, the shift is happening. It is happening. But often when we look at the bigger situation, it's exactly those conditions that are missing. Thank you. Uh, what, what, what simulation was that? Was it En-ROADS? Yeah, En-ROADS. Mm -hmm. Penelope, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you uh, want to guide us or comment on us or tell us what we should do quote for your generation let us know okay um i'm just thinking about stuff like this because it's so hard to like feel like you're making a difference and it's crazy being in this call because everyone in here has made some big difference and as a 14 year old in a small town kentucky i'm like oh well <laughs> i'm not really doing anything so it's like it's just weird to hear about everything that you could be doing because i guess I know what I need to do. And I always think when I grow up, I'll live off sustainable energy. When I grow up, I'll use public transportation. But while I'm here now, I feel like I'm not making much of a difference. So that's just what I've always had a problem with. And it is so depressing to think that like, you have a huge problem and I'm such a small part of it that it almost like doesn't matter. So I don't know what like to do in that case. You know what I'm saying? It's just kind of sad to think that even though I care, it's not really like it's making that much of a difference. And maybe it is, mm -hmm. but it just feels so small, you know? Well, it is, I mean, look, yeah, I think it's making a difference because you can speak to your peers. And I mean, my 14 year old right now is playing Call of Duty. So, I mean, <laughs> it's a different level of engagement for, you know, someone like you who's engaged in this and goes and listens to boring Gen Xers and boomers talking about their, you know, their livelihoods. I, everybody is small, right? There's 8 billion people, so nobody's big, but it has to happen person by person. I don't, you know, there's no other way. So I think it's great if you can talk to friends and say, oh, I was on the call with these guys, here's what I learned. You know, it, it just spreads knowledge, right? And, and love on some level for, for what we, do, we need to do. To, to follow Andrew and, and which is too. Penelope, when we did some looking at companies that committed to quality management four decades or so ago, um, and the CEOs who led the way, it turned out that I don't think we ever found one CEO who hadn't gotten the message from somebody in the organization, including somebody very low in the organization. And so whatever we say, we don't realize the impact it have, can have all around the system. And the, uh, the key thing I think is to speak mm -hmm. and to say what's important to be said and just realize that the, a couple of words here may change the world.
Well, I mean, just a quick thought. I've done research with CEOs on the ones who talked about sustainability, like why do they care? And the business case, which I've spent 20 years building, is like the fourth reason. It's like it has to be there so they have the logic. The number one reason was very often their family, their kids, you know, hearing from their own kids. I, I, I've heard that story over and over from executives that it just comes down to, you know, who they are as a person and they need to hear it from, from their kids. So I think that's the influence, right? You come in both as a child and then eventually as a young, you know, someone in schools pushing on your teachers, then a young employee, just pushing on people and asking the questions, it matters. They hear it and, and it affects them. And I, I wanna jump in. I got one for you, Penelope. Um, I, I request that you ask your parents, uh, what do you know about climate change and what have you learned about it? And then a month later, you ask them the same question again. And the next month you ask them the same question again. And you ask your friends to do the same thing with their parents. And we see if we can spread that around the country in a few months. That would make a difference. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> I your parents will have pretty good answers, I think, but there's a lot of parents in your neighborhood, in your area in Kentucky, who don't have good answers to that question. Yeah. By the way, someday I'll tell you all the answers a past president Academy of Management made to that kind of question to me about 10 years ago. That was absolutely a disgrace. Uh, what I wanted to say earlier is, Penelope, thanks for those comments, because I think we actually feel the same way as you do. So that you feel that now is important because you can act on it now. I don't know what I was feeling when I was 14 exactly, but my 14 year old took the dog out of the room. At least she's helping in that way. But I tried to get her on camera today too, just a little while and she won't join us. <laughs> um, mostly embarrassment factor probably from her dad. But to build on um, what Andrew was saying earlier in terms of how do we get people to do this, we show them that it's easy. Right? that it's easy to make a decision that has less impact on the environment, that enables people by the choices that you make in the food you buy, the homes you live in, the buildings. We spend 93% of our time in buildings. We never really think about how energy efficient are they or how much do they help us in terms of our own air quality. You know, so think consciously about those things. And the other thing I like to do is then ask people what their vision is of the future. Almost like Jim's question, you know, how much do you know about something, right? And then come back in a month, but what's your vision now of what a sustainable future would look like? And then you can layer into that other questions. Well, what would the balance sheet look like? And is it really balanced if it doesn't include environmental impacts for a company or social value that that company creates? Because then to get to the net positive narrative, what if your company has a great net positive story to tell, but you don't know how to measure it and you don't know how to tell it? And somebody else in your industry seems to be doing a lot better than you, but they're a much worse company. They're higher risk. They're doing things in their supply chains that people don't want to hear about. And if those types of things come out, we have better transparency. What would the world look like if all businesses were net positive? What kind of a vision would that be? That's the kind of thing I would like to get to and then backcast from it and say, okay, what can we do tomorrow? What can we do today? That gets us one step closer. It's just one decision. Right, but it's one decision at a time we get there, one person at a time, and then it becomes significant, even if we feel insignificant along the way. Kristen, I think the work, thank you. The, Kristen, I think the work you're doing really addresses uh, Penelope's question pretty directly. Yeah, and Penelope, thanks for articulating that. And also just thanks for your honesty in saying that you feel ineffectual and therefore that sometimes is a, it's like a block or a hindrance to wanting to do something, even though you know that things need to be done. So it's kind of a push me, pull me thing. My, my guess has been that to not talk about the climate crisis is, is more anxiety producing than to, um, to talk about it. And that's the gamble I'm making right now by inviting undergraduate students just a little bit you know, older than you by a few years to lean into the climate crisis. And um, we really have to look at how many artists are behind all this activity. You really can't scratch an organization that's climate crisis oriented and not find artists and people who study the humanities and social scientists. So, you know, like someone said, the scientists have already done their job. We already have the information. Now we need the storytelling. We need the heart. We need the feelings. We need, um, we also need social groups. So even though a lot of our individual behaviors 
um, are individual and they need to be checked in our households, you know, our household emissions is like 20% of our greenhouse gases. We can't, even though we have to do individual things like composting, like I don't grab a group of friends together when I compost. I do that alone, right? <laughs> in the privacy of my backyard under my orange tree. Um, but I know there's a social group that's doing the same thing. And my awareness of that social group and my belonging to those social groups is what kind of makes me smile while I go out on a cold morning in Northern California and uh, compost, right, in my bare feet. So this is what we did with our initiative is we realized, you know, I'm a choreographer and so what do I do? I work in time and space. Those are my elements. And so I was thinking, no one is taking the time to talk about the climate crisis where I was working, in my opinion. No one had a space for it. It's not in the catalog. It's not in the course catalog. There isn't um, an hour of the day that we're supposed to you know, sit down and talk about this. But we had time to talk about raising money for the university all the time. Yeah. A day of giving, a day of this. But we never had a day of climate crisis. So I thought, got to make time, got to make space, and have to have the social permission to talk yeah. about it. So it, belonging to an organization is a great excuse to have the time, the space, and the social permission to talk about this stuff, know there are like-minded people, and then when you're turning off your electrical you know, cords in the house and stuff like that, you, you know there's a, there are other people doing it. And I think that knowledge, that you're a part of a community doing this, a worldwide community, and that you're in the slowest nation to do it, you know, uh, is, is great knowledge to have. Like, look at what developing countries are doing. It's so inspiring. They're, they're moving, you know, in such a faster speed than we are at um, sustainable development. So, yeah, I'll stop. Oh, I still have a little time. Um, I teach in child studies, and I believe that, that kids, teens, undergrads, yeah, they have a push to make. But we really can't make them feel like we're just saying, oh, you, it's up to you guys. I really feel like that's unconscionable, right, for us to say, oh, you know, you guys have a big problem, don't you? You know, that kind of tone. It, it, it breaks my heart when I hear adults saying that to younger people because, no, it's us and you. It's an intergenerational, huge collaboration. And we're all, you know, we're all in it together and we're here for you. Um, there are some adults who don't get that, and that must be really just terrifying. Um, I do believe that the mark of a society that has failed is when all the children are terrified. And all the children are terrified right now in the world. Mm -hmm. So when we say, oh, we have great managers, we have great leaders, we have great business schools, like, well, not really. We're not managing anything. We're not leading anything. This is where I think the perspectives of black, indigenous, and people of color, women, children, and all vulnerable populations come in. Because those are people that have experience with resiliency. They have experience with crises. And those are the people we should be... Um, including and um, bringing up, lifting up in all of these conversations. They should be in the room all the time. So I would encourage everyone to always work with indigenous people if you're not indigenous yourself and with BIPOC people if you're not uh, BIPOC and with women and children if you're not a woman or a child. We have about eight minutes left, folks. I have, uh, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, all of these things. And I have to add something just, uh, you know, maybe uh, another dimension of, of, of the same uh, challenge. And that is, uh, so often that's kind of how we approach these topics, kind of to uh, uh, basically one person at a time, one company at a time, and so on and so forth. But in reality, that's not even the main problem, right? The main problem is not that too few people maybe source their food in CSAs, which is also the problem. The main problem is that each year we fund $1 trillion, the wrong agricultural model. Each year we put $4 trillion into the wrong energy model. That's the problem. It's the problem of collective decision-making. Mm -hmm. And uh, nowhere that's more visible than here in this country, but it's, uh, it's a problem all over the place. So I wonder how that could be uh, also, uh, Penelope, to, to your, that has to do with how a group uh, is taking decisions, right? It's about the collective decision-making in communities, in schools, but also on the level of society. And it has to do essentially with the question of democracy, right? So that's um, that's a little slightly more cons compl complex than just one person at a time, one company at a time. Mm -hmm. 
Well, this this is why so much the, the core of my next book is a lot of it is about this positive advocacy that companies have to advocate to change all those incentives and advocate, frankly, I think much more openly for the for supporting the politicians who vote for those the, the better policies and shifting capital to clean economy or to you know more sustainable practices. And they're so afraid to get political that I, I was pleasantly surprised going into the US election that you started to see companies trying to defend democracy and saying, you know, they would, you know, the, and the pharma companies saying, we're not going to rush the vaccine. We're going to follow science. Like the fact that companies have to say this stuff is scary, but I'm hoping they'll get more courage. That's why we have courageous in our subtitle. I'm hoping they get more courageous and speak out against these bad policies. I mean, of course there's sectors like agriculture who benefit, but the rest don't like a, a Unilever, the CPG companies don't benefit from the wrong format of agriculture. They really don't, not in the long run because the productivity goes down, the soil gets worse, you know? And if you take the longer view, you should be advocating for just systemic change. And, and you know, and the, and the people that, I, I'm glad there's more transparency now, like you're, you're seeing companies get called out for saying they want say, renewable policy or agriculture policy one way, and then basically funneling money to trade associations or politicians who are running, who have no interest in that. Someone came out and showed that a bunch of tech companies gave money to the two uh, Republican senators in Georgia right now. And it's like, if they have, the, and like Microsoft has this giant climate goal, the best in the world, and they're supporting people that will make it impossible for them to get there, right? Without the, without the US government. So I, I, part of the thing I think like Penelope and, and younger people can do is just push transparency and demand mm -hmm. and, and just expect it. And that's, I think you see that more and more. Um, right. And just demand that companies are, are honest and open about everything they're doing and all of their practices. But yeah, it's not easy, but I think the demand for transparency is going to be really powerful. As Andrew and, and, and Otto were speaking, it occurred to me that something that hadn't occurred to me, the Republican Party is clearly in breakdown right now. It's been captured by Trump and it's looking like that's a dead end. But breakdown is the opportunity for breakthrough. And I wonder if we could write some scenarios that would make sense for a new Republican Party with the healthy parts of the Republican Party, taking those very constructive perspectives on how we bring about these changes. Hmm. And maybe there's some hope for a party that right now is just fundamentally evil as it's currently doing its things. Hmm. But, uh, and, and laying out a dialogue for the a narrative, the Republican Party could challenge the Democratic Party to continue to do better and better stuff over time. There's so, an op-ed from Thomas Friedman today in the New York Times about this. I think he's optimistic, but he's saying the Republicans should cleave into two and, and the more the, the reasonable ones who actually believe in the Constitution can maybe start creating a different, a different party or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how that would actually happen, but I hope. I mean, it make it would make sense. Well, it sounds like uh, the old joke about the two percent of lawyers that gave the rest of the uh, what is it the, the uh, I'm trying to remember the ninety eight percent of the lawyers give the remaining two percent a bad reputation, something <laughs> along that line. It slipped away. So maybe there's some good Republicans out there we can work with. Yeah. Michael, you've been a little quiet. Well, I was just. Uh thinking about what Robert, you were saying about we need to make it easy. I was wondering whether the opportunity is actually embracing that it's hard. I see that there is a, I mean, there are so many levels of dysfunction and ultimately I think it breaks down in, in, our, in our fundamental humanity. We do strive for hard things, not for easy things. We want purpose. We want higher purpose. If we don't have it, we're we're desperate, we're, we're suicidal and all of these things. So making it easy may remove the opportunity to really get people present to that this is a lifetime task. This is a human challenge that we can all embrace. I was just listening to, I think Sebastian Junger on Tribe and how war is sort of the force, the antidepressant. Uh, there are many bad things to war, but just getting people to rally around some cause removes suicide, removes depression, removes all these kind of uh, pandemics that we currently have. The question really is what is the higher purpose and how can we specify it out and how can we get people present that it is 
a task for all of us in a lifetime that gives us purpose, enlivens us, enlightens us uh, by, by learning and enlivens us in a way because that's what we as a species thrive on if we, if we create these solutions to these challenges that are fundamentally threatening to our survival. So I think that framing can also get us to embrace it in a way that's like, oh, okay, this is actually a good thing. You know, you run a marathon, not because it's easy and, and all these things. And everybody wants to get challenged and, and I'm just not so present to seeing that, that upside of, of the whole conversation. I, I totally Thank appreciate you. the reframing of the word easy. I think integrated is more is what I'm just trying to get at. So that, like quality management of the past, it took decades, right? Before people realized quality should be part of everything we do in manufacturing. The better the quality, the better the product, the better the service that could be associated with it. So I'm probably more trying to position that as integrated to the point where we don't have to think about it. It'll be more baked into what we do. It's a long time between we get to there from now and that it should be a struggle for some. For others, it will be somewhat easier, right? If we let technology enable that. But again, not focusing on the word easy as much as maybe integrated. So that when we look at companies and companies can know that they have nowhere to run. You know, my students already have access to 600 environmental, social and governance performance metrics per publicly traded firm in the United States. And if firms think that no one's watching, they're wrong. We need to let them know when they aren't doing what we want them to do, that we are watching, that we'll not buy their products or pay for their services anymore. It's two o'clock and I know some of you definitely have to go at two o'clock. And so please don't feel embarrassed if you move on with your next adventure. Um, I'll stick around for a little while because I have a little bit of freedom right now. But I want to yeah. thank all of you for being here. <laughs> Thanks for convening. Thank, thank you, you, Jim. This was yeah, great to meeting you all. This was great, great to, to meet, meet every, Yeah, great to meet everybody and a great, great uh, discussion. Very inspiring. And uh, Penelope, you're our future. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We're working for you, Penelope. Yes, thank exactly. You. Thank all of you so much. It's so cool to hear all these different opinions and um, views that I don't hear every day in this little small world that I have. So hearing the bigger picture is so cool. Thank you so much. Happy New Year, all. Good luck. Yeah. Look okay. Seeing see you in the news, Penelope, in the future. Looking forward to your accomplishments. <laughs> I, I do want to note that Michael basically has brought Otto and Tony and Andrew and to a considerable extent, uh, Robert to Fordham. Um, in a variety of ways, and uh, plus keeping James around, of course, who's up on the corner there. So, he's, Michael, he's you've been just a, convincing. a terrific job at Fordham. It's been, you've been a real gift to us. Thank you so much. Well done, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Michael. Care. I look forward to, uh, to the... be continued. <laughs> to be continued. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, folks. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Great to meet you. Great to meet you now in person. Great to meet you too, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and your holidays. These are great folks, aren't they? That you. It was a wonderful group. Yes, thank you so much. Now you have a connection to all of them. How wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.